Hello and welcome to the Volunteer Firefighting Podcast. I am here with uh, two members of my firefighting family. <laughs> I had to count. I had to count. It's been a long day. I'm Scott Ash. Oh, hey there. We've got Scott. Hey. And we have a special guest tonight. We have uh, Kyle. Say hello, Kyle. Hi, how's it going? Good. So uh, Kyle uh, Tomney comes from uh, Verona uh, Volunteer Fire Department. You're from Verona. Screw that up. <laughs> Um, yeah, so east of Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, Kyle, why don't you uh, say hello to everyone, give yourself a little introduction, and um, we'll go from there. Tell us a little bit about your department. Um, I've been I've been around the service my whole life. I'm fifth generation. Um, what am I trying to – oh, I've been in my department for 10 years. It was the first department I joined. Uh, a couple of years ago, I moved up to lieutenant and um, been trying to make improvements since. Awesome. How did you find that the, the changeover from uh, the firefighter up to one of the officers? Um, that was that was that was different. Um, the first week that I was lieutenant, um, everybody in my department, except for me, got COVID. So <laughs> I was uh, kind of thrown to the wolves. And then um, my first call as an officer was a uh, two alarm structure fire, so it was a uh, it was a huge, huge, huge change. Yeah, with us, a lot of the time in the past, it was always uh, by vote, you know, during elections and stuff for your terms. Um, now I know for my department, it's all application process and interview. Um, and then qualifications yeah. uh, leading up to it. And you guys are going to that as well now. Yeah. 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 Um, with with your guys' department, so you guys are all 100% uh, volunteers, so no paid on call, no full-time staff. Correct. Yeah. What? Um, how do you guys do your transitions from firefighter to officer? Do you guys have terms, or what do you kind of run? Um, we are not voted on. There's no application process. Um, we're actually appointed by our chief, which seems to be the only department that does that. I don't know anyone else that does that. But um, no, there's no like term limit or anything. As long as you're doing your job and and keeping going, you're you're pretty much you're still there. Interesting. Do you guys do any sort of annual review or just to make sure that you are still hitting the mark or? Um, I think we're going to be implementing that here soon. Nice. Um, we had a leadership change, I guess, for lack of a better word, and we're trying to implement things like that now. Right. Well, so you said you were a fifth generation for that. Yeah. Thing. So the first guy in the line, what was he, like running horses? Or how, how was that? <laughs> I actually have a picture of my – well, let me back up. My family tells me a fifth generation that that could be skewed. Um, (laughs) But I do have a picture of um, my ancestors next to a horse drawn hose hose carriage. If I I, I have a it's a it's hanging up on my wall. I'll get a picture of it for you guys. That's cool. That's very cool. Todd's almost been around for that. that (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Did you have a chance to uh, be on the department when um, your other family members were on as well? Or? Um, I'm actually in a different department than my family member family members were. I'm just you know that uh, as far as the service goes, I'm generational. Right. Um, I wanted to join that department, then we moved and too far away, so I'm at where I am now. Awesome. That's still all connected, though, right? Like you said. Keeping that keeping that flow going, that's pretty cool to see that uh, carry cool. on through the through the family ties, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier about um, just kind of um, strategies, tactics, small towns, medium towns, <laughs> big towns, <laughs> all, yeah. all, the, all the above. Um, is there anything you guys want to touch base on, or I, I guess our uh, our thing we 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 mentioned it. We always talk about. Uh, the roof versus versus uh, positive pressure. Yes, or, uh, positive pressure. Um, so you guys uh, out east, and I don't know. I don't know if it's out east Canada too, but out east, it's always a roof. <laughs> yeah, 
you hear you hear out here we never go on the roof. Uh, like no, I shouldn't say never. We rarely ever go on the roof, especially in Romantic. Um so uh, so out there, yes, is that that's what you guys do for tactics? Yeah, we we do um almost every fire I've been to, unless it's self vented through the roof, we are up there cutting a hole in the roof. Um I don't know, to me it just makes more sense. That's the way the smoke's gonna go. Yeah. That's the way it wants to go, lets the heat out, lets the smoke out. Right. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm a big fan of hydraulic ventilation as well mm -hmm. af after you knock it, but, um, yeah, it almost always, always, always we're cutting a hole in the roof. I wonder where that line or the divide ever happened. Cause I, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I know like out here, like we always, we obviously look at it as a, as a safety thing. Um, I don't know how many. Like we always, you know, we see videos. I'm sure you guys see videos of, of the positive pressure going wrong as well. Um, you know, we, oh, always, yeah. we always see videos of uh, every video has of a guy falling through a roof. <laughs> so maybe that's well, there was a uh, <laughs> video out of California that uh, I think it was a captain fell through the roof. Yeah, in, uh, in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when we all, you know, it always gets shown. Uh, this is why we don't uh, go on roofs anymore. Actually, uh, we we did a course. Um, but, yes, new course. That's right. And basically, the, a major city, and they don't go on the roof at all. Like, like we'll still go on the roof when when it's needed, but they, these guys are like, no, we never. Like, we, yeah, it's like hard, and fast. It's hard and fast. Never go on the roof for like, oh yeah, like that's and that's a major city here in, in Canada uh, on the west coast, anyways. And pretty aggressive as well. Yeah, they're aggressive fire department, but yeah, they they've made a policy never go on the roof now. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's just it's interesting how the difference is. Mm -hmm. yeah. with, with your structures out there, is it? Uh, is it older mostly? Like, is it mostly? Oh, old? yeah. Yeah, there's very, very little. Um, there might only be like a couple structures in our town itself that are um, new construction. In neighboring districts, we have new construction, but uh, very, very little in our own. And I wonder if that has something to do with that, the roof thing, because out here with all the new construction, <clears throat> the roof uh, trusses fail so quickly. So, so quickly, quickly. yeah. So that that could be the reason why we, why we started with why we've always just stuck with the positive pressure. Positive pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a um, we had a structure fire a few years ago. It was in new construction, and we were on scene pretty quickly. And there, there was already fire through the roof. There was yeah. no going up there at that point. Yeah, I, I guess having said that, like we just had a fire here uh, last week. Um, yeah. And it was an old, it was an old house, uh, lath and plaster and all that. And, I mean, it, it had a metal roof, but even the metal, even without the metal roof, I, I think it probably would have been a viable roof to, to cut if we were so inclined. Yeah, just because yeah. it's definitely one of those older structures. So maybe that, maybe that is why we don't love roofs because mm -hmm. of all the new construction. Yeah, and you know, I mean, like back in the day, the conversation always was as well as was the style of our roofing. A lot of them were steeper pitch for the snow loads in certain communities. Um, by saying that, of course, this isn't the typical Canadian stereotypical, you know, igloo and we're, we're surrounded by snow. We live in a desert for the record. <laughs> but, you know, like there's always the, the types and pitch, um, and then depending on, on your height of your uh, structure as well. But like, like see, even shit, going back 20 years, like we didn't do a whole lot of roof ops. Uh, we we did, definitely did some. Fun, but, <laughs> But no, yeah, nothing, nothing like down down south. Well, kind of where, but I know uh, the one thing we always make fun of uh, the American fire departments is: is there a water shortage <laughs> down there? Because we never see water on the fire. <laughs> um, I think there's. I don't. We get. We try to get water on the fire as quick as we possibly can. Obviously, but. Uh, I know when you watch some of these videos, it's like you're, it feels like you're sitting there for 10 minutes before they get yeah. water on. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd, around here, we, we try to get on, we try to get it on pretty quick. Yeah. And maybe it's because uh, that's what, that's what gets the clicks when firefighters uh, screw up, I guess, more clicks than like <laughs> when guys are doing really good work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is when it's, uh, when guys are like, oh, these idiots, <laughs> it's taking them 10 minutes to get water on. <laughs> the YouTube channel. Yeah, so yeah. that might be it. And obviously the population of uh, America is much greater than Canada. Probably more firefighters in Canada than there is. Or in America than there are citizens in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but it's interesting, you know, like uh, like all, all jokes aside, like um, you know, like the just the knowledge of, of all the studies and stuff that have been out there now, you know, as far as just getting that wa exterior water application so rapidly, and it could be a short amount because uh, a lot of our rural areas for in our, for our area, you know, we're in there, we've depleted that half a tank in no time, and now we're right. waiting for shutter um, to shuttle um, tenders back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it takes a little bit of time to start mobilizing and get water. So, uh, it's definitely challenging. Yeah. On that, what's your guys' water supply like? Do you have a lot of uh, hydrants in your Oh, shop? yeah, we have a ton. Um, I I might have only been on a couple calls myself with a uh, tanker or tender. But, um, no, we're hydrant operations are, are huge here. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, we're almost the opposite. Uh, I, we just that, that fire but well, that was the first time I think I've hit a hydrant in quite some time. Quite well, actually, no, I guess we did the car fire a few weeks ago, but yeah, yeah we don't, we, yeah, we, we normally, it's, it's all tender work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I probably wouldn't even know what to do if I had to run tanker operations. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it can be challenging, but. Yeah, I mean, that just brings in a whole other level of, you know, water, you know, water usage. And, I mean, it's cool to see studies of how much water application is required to put out a single room of contents versus something that's gone up into the structure. Um, like one, one thing that a lot of firefighters are good at is filling basements with water. So when you're attached to a hydrant, it's super easy just to keep flowing, flowing, flowing. I mean, when you have an endless supply of water, eventually the fire is going to go out when it's, yeah. you know, submerged. But once you have a finite amount of water, when it's coming from a you know water tender tanker, um, you know you have to be a, a little bit more switched on with your uh, water application. Which oh, absolutely, I agree. Is uh, yeah, it's just another thing that you have to be thinking about. You know, especially as an officer. Now, you mentioned earlier um, you guys do a lot of mutual aid. As well, like your your district, uh, how like how large? What's the kind of the footprint? You said it was like twenty five hundred people in your community. Yeah, and we're about uh, I want to say like two square miles. Um, it's it's not big. I mean, you can drive from one end to the other in a couple minutes. Um, but we do run a lot of mutual aid. Um, our mutual aid footprint's a lot larger. But um, yeah, it seems like almost seems like you guys don't run mutual aid almost every single call we have somebody coming into our area or we're going into their area yeah mutual aid definitely is a uh it's not a you know it's not a common you know maybe two or three times a year right probably i'd say mm -hmm. um, yeah it's not a out of four three four hundred calls like two or three times a year is actually i mean so i mean you know, we just did it last week but that was the first time in, in a long time since yeah since wildfire yeah. yeah since the big wildfires yeah yeah, which was perfect to have you guys, obviously, with the way things were progressing. But um, yeah, that was pretty pretty interesting. But we don't utilize it as often. But you know, thinking if you're just over two two square mile, I mean, what's our depth downtown core? I mean, we're that's it's probably very similar footprint to like yeah. you know all of our proper. We just have such a vast rural district that um, you know we we might be that two square mile, if you will, right in the middle, but then we're six times, you know, further oh, yeah. as as our uh, coverage area expands. And it's very rural, it's very, um, we got some intermix, we have some interface, um, kind of, you know, sprinkled, you know, towards the out, the outskirts, which obviously bring a lot of different tactics there as well. Um, so for you guys, how, how dense is the population everywhere that you respond to? Do you have, like, is it all city or do you have some, uh, like, wildland wooded areas that uh, you guys look after or maybe would go and mutual with? Um, we would have a better chance of going mutual aid with a wildland situation. Um, but even then, I think I've been on two brush fires mm -hmm. in my career. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, but as far as like population density, the areas that we run into are definitely, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty populated. We don't, 
obviously you have your pockets where you could have a brush fire or a wildland fire, but it it wouldn't get too out of control. It's not even like kilometers of, or, or miles of uh, burnt, burnt forest. No. Yeah. Right. Um, I guess they, they, always the other question is um, combination or smooth bore? Always the... <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> we have these nozzles that when you when you pull the bail back it, it turns into smooth bore so I'm, I'm a big fan of that um i i've i don't have much experience with a smooth bore to be honest with you but it is is as is, is much controversy as there is with it i would like to give it a shot and make my own my own assumption yeah, we definitely, uh, you know, recently we actually, we, we picked up another inch and a half smooth bore that we kind of tested and we're, we're actually thinking of running like smooth bore on one side and combi on the other side just for that duality. Right. And then obviously the one up the back, or two and a half, is a, is a smooth bore um, just for that deluge, uh, which I think we've talked about. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, and that, uh, we had that running on that fire the other day and, you know, it just, it just, the amount of BTUs that they could knock out uh compared to the combination when we used to use it and the fact that you can run it on such a low low volume a low pressure yeah yeah is even yeah. uh stopping and right from the truck so yeah. you said he's running it at, at, the, at, the, right, at the right yes. pressure <laughs> it's like oh thank god <laughs> yes yeah. yeah some guys run it really hot but that's i think the biggest thing guys run that they run that um smooth bore like at the, at the the psi of a, of a combination nozzle and it just doesn't work that way right right yeah. right yeah, and that's I find um, when we're teaching new people some new puff ops, work with uh, the hose changes and stuff as well. Is is they usually get that uh, that wrong. They're usually over pressuring the uh, the smooth bore, whether it's inch and a half, inch three quarter, or even just that blitz, blitz line at two and a half, right? Right. right. Uh, but uh, once you use it more and more, you can tell quickly by just the droplets and, and how it disperses out of the tip pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And I mean. Run a two and a half smooth bore. Uh, it's very easy by yourself. Versus, yeah. What is that? The right pressure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Right pressure. Versus that two and a half. Yeah. yeah. And like any high rise or apartment pack ops should yeah. obviously be ran through a smooth through a smooth bore, if if at all possible, just because we all know that's an awesome stash spot for debris, blah blah blah, and those standpipe. So. Um, and we went back to, like, we got some pretty frigid temperatures here, and we've actually frozen up lines running our combi nozzles uh, where ice will start to form in the line and will actually jam at the tip. Um, if that was wide open, it would just shoot out. So, and in theory, yeah, so we haven't. <laughs> That's a theory this year. We are going to be, well, <laughs> I don't know if we'll try to freeze shit up, but <laughs> if it happens, and we'll see what the uh, smooth board does. Yeah. So you guys still get pretty cold temperatures just outside of Pittsburgh. Of oh yeah. Colder colder than us probably. So um yeah, do you guys find any any issues um like with what you're running for your trucks or anything different on them? Um we there's been a couple of times we ran a dry pump. Uh we haven't done that in a few years. Um if if I'm the driver and pump operator I, and I pull up and it's usually below 37 36 degrees fahrenheit um i'll put the truck in pump and just circulate the water mm -hmm. if we have lines off just crack the uh bale open and that seems to do pretty good don't seem to have too many issues with that uh we've we've seen uh departments freeze pumps and freeze uh tanks and uh bend waterways on their ladders when they're trying to retract them back in because they froze but uh, as long it seems like as long as you keep the water flowing, you're you're fine. Yeah, yeah, that's too as well. And then the guys quickly realize that they have to pay attention to where they're dropping that nozzle with it being cracked, because otherwise you got skating. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where you're working. Yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about your area for uh, rescues. Like, what do you guys run? Do you guys run highway rescue or rope rescue or water rescues? Um, we are right on a river. So we, we, we have two boats that one boat is always in the water. Um, as far as rescue goes that we actually run that that's really it. If we have any kind of vehicle rescue or 
um, rope rescue, we actually call in mutual aid because we do it so seldomly. Um, not to say that we shouldn't train in it because we still do train in it, but for us to spend the the money on the equipment is um, I don't want to say outrageous, but it just doesn't add up sometimes. So um, the two companies that um, we use for mutual aid for any kind of vehicle rescue or uh, high angle rescue or anything like that, they um, they're usually there's sometimes they beat us there to the call, which is, as far as I'm concerned, fine with me. Uh, if, if they can get somebody uh, freed or, or out of the situation they're in, that's that's fine. So your guys' response model, you'll still get paged out for the call as it's within your uh, jurisdiction. You guys will respond. Um, is that an automatic mutual aid that you guys have set up, or do you have to ask for it based on the details that are coming through? It's um it's an automatic mutual aid as long as all the calls come through um dispatch correctly. Um yeah. know, as long as they get the uh sure. all the details from the the caller, right? Uh, there are times when you get on scene and you say, Oh, I need this and I mean you can call them in, it's no problem, but usually it's it's automatic. That's nice. That'd be awful. <laughs> <laughs> some some occasions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you guys run um, like a first responder model or have like paramedics or EMTs on the truck in your department? Um, I know like some departments run the, the ambulance out of the halls or what do you guys have for that kind of cross cover? Um, a number of years ago, we actually ran an ambulance service here. Um, we no longer do that. We do have, I think, two EMTs here, um, but they're they're affiliated with other agencies or not necessarily affiliated with the, with the fire department itself, but we do have them in, in case we need them, yeah. but they kind of, they went off on their own to get that certification. If that makes sense. Yeah. So is it, is it a state run ambulance or is it a um, county run or? Uh, I'm sorry, you, you cut out. Is it, is it state run or is it county or private or? How, how does your service, like ambulance service, work? Um, it's it the around us. It it it, it it's uh it's private. It's all private ambulance service. Second job. Yeah. Some of the things that uh, we're passionate about and what you know, you're passionate about. Um, you want to talk about anything um, specific with uh, the fire service, some of your passions that you've been bringing into it and making changes in your department? Um, actually, some of the changes that we have made or some of the changes I'm trying to push for is um, getting that real life inoculation that you guys talk about all the time to get the, to get the stress levels up. Um, a lot of our training for a long time was it was slower paced. And as anybody in the fire service knows, that's the last thing you want to be is slow pace. And it made, it makes learning a lot tougher. So um, what we're work, what I'm working towards now, and you know, uh, some of the other guys too, we're working towards getting that pace up, getting that speed up um, and, and trying to get that training up to like more of a real life situation, you know, as best as you can. So with that, do you guys have a, a local training center or like how often do you guys practice? Um, we meet at the hall every Monday night. Um, we try to practice two months out of, out of the month or two Mondays out of the month. I'm sorry. Uh, but we do have a training center. It's actually fairly new. It's in um, one of the communities that we run mutual aid into, and um, they let us use their facility. Uh, for us to have our own would be very tough with where we're from. But we have that that we can use. We have a um, 
we have a county training center that's they put on a lot of classes up there and that you can go there and get your certifications and you know your your essentials and then go on from there to get whatever else you would like yeah i think uh i think as you know the, the big thing we really like doing is is that um uh, you know that high fidelity like mm -hmm. training training like, like do all your training yeah, don't you layer it in you know and then then do a scenario based training right Let's make it as realistic as we can in a training environment and that stress inoculation right yeah um, and, and like and it's, it's, you need it like it, set off some smoke alarms uh create some smoke um, yeah. you know, turn off the lights like make, make things difficult loud like you know the last one at seminar that you taught Scott, you had a speaker playing yeah screaming and yelling them. um yeah i heard a, a quote today from a, a guy who teaches like gunfighting tactics and he's like because he was he's been at a few gunfights and he said uh experience experience with consequence sucks because if you're if you if your first experience <laughs> gunfight is consequences you're going to die so that sucks because experience without consequence is training so basically that's because what we do we train yeah. but there's no consequence at the end like we're not going to die if we if, like the roof is not going to collapse hopefully in the burn building or you know i mean people <laughs> might get hurt but there should be no real real danger of of the consequence of not finding a not finding a dummy instead of fires that doesn't mean we left a child inside a building right so so yeah i really like that because yeah it's, it's that consequence is, is what is what the training is missing and that's what is allowing us to train more because if there's consequences every time we train we're not going to train <laughs> if someone's yeah. gonna, if there was like the life is on actually on the line every time we train that wouldn't be very good but um realistically if you don't train and you're out in the world um, that consequence that's where your experience comes from yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's crazy like we know departments that are like that but you know they're only hands-on is when it's a live event and you know some of them might be volunteers some of them might be full-on staff um you know they don't utilize their their extra time their off time to go and train and like that just blow you know blows our mind um no, I don't care if it's every week, if it's twice a week, if it's once or twice a month. Uh, just finding that time to go out there, getting hands-on tools, you know, getting that uh, muscle memory, and like really, you know, working on that craft. Um, and like you know, these guys were saying, making that uh, stress that you know stress level high. I, I don't think there's there's really no other uh, like no other replacement for that. And you can't you can't mimic that in real life because of those consequences so yeah yeah it's cool cool to hear that you, you know you guys have a couple uh areas around you uh when you go to train at your mutual aid hall where they have a training facility is that uh uh fee fee for service there or are you allowed to train there for free or where you go and then secondly you say there's a uh government funded one uh is that a, a fee for service or do you guys have access to both of those facilities uh, on the house. Um, the the one in our mutual aid district, we we pretty much have access to that whenever we would like. Um, and usually, if we're going up there, we're going to invite them to go along. In that township, they actually have six departments, okay. so they're a lot larger than us. So maybe we'll invite a couple of their departments that we run with more often, but. Um, yeah, we pretty much have access to that whenever. As far as the government facility, um, that's more of like a like like signing up for a class and going up to their academy and doing it. Um, you don't really have any kind of access to it. Did you guys have uh, like acquired structures in your area? <laughs> Seems like every time we try to look at one, when we go inside, it's just, it's not happening. Because they've been sitting for too long. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of rules and regulations to make an acquired structure work. Uh, you got to yeah. down and, and hold it. <clears throat> and it's really not a structure anymore. <laughs> yeah, basically almost not a structure anymore. <laughs> yeah. Versus back in the day, the acquired structures that we had, we just went and started fuck. Sure. Yeah. But the uh, person hasn't moved out, they're like, I don't feel like moving my furniture. <laughs> it's like, I don't feel like moving my furniture. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, 
So let's talk a little bit about um, resilience and whatnot within the fire service and emergency services. So we talked about, um, you know, like all of us, like everybody kind of shares a little bit of a, of a personal story with it. Um, and just the, the importance of, you know, having that time to debrief and bumper talk and kind of what we do as organizations um, for support, whether it's a SISM team, uh, like instant stress, critical instant stress teams. Um, yeah, what uh, what kind of structures do you guys have out in your department? Um, once again, that's actually something that we're trying to implement implement more. Not to say that before we wouldn't have had something if if we needed it, but um, now it seems to be more out there with leadership coming to you and saying, "Hey, if you need this, let me know. If you don't, okay." Um, but yeah, I'm trying to get that more of like an official um more of like an official um like the briefing i guess you could say but um as far as the bumper talk that's that's almost every, after every call after every training after every event we do any kind of public event we come up here and we're usually here for another hour two hours if if we need it yeah the bumper talk definitely just happens naturally Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or even after a scene occurs, if we're hanging around on scene for something, it usually starts right then. It starts as, we're, as yeah. we're at rehab, drinking a bottle of water, you know, whatever we're doing. As buffer talk just naturally progresses. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I find it's it's very important. You know, like we look at a lot of um, we do the bumper talks. That we talked about okay well when when is a time or an event that we need to do an actual debriefing or just a simple peer check-in um so one thing my service does we do a lot of peer check-ins and i think we're going to be seeing more and more of that fall into the fire service as well so rather than saying hey everybody on that event you know that what that that one homogenous group of, of firefighters that were just involved in that event we're going to have a, a sit down debrief which is Potentially good, but also you may not need it. So one way to kind of find that out is, well, let's let's do some peer check-ins. So if you have some of the members in your department trained through the SISM program to have the safe talk experience, um, to be able to just phone up somebody and say, hey, man, you know, just check in with you. You know, that's a pretty crazy call. Um, you know, and kind of evoke how they're feeling and what, what you want to uh, get out of it. Mm-hmm. It's important not to talk too much about um, tactics. I mean, sometimes that stuff just flows naturally yeah. into um, the de- de- defusing, debriefing type of scenarios, um, which is okay because that's part of how who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Just that simple, like, hey, let's just do a quick little phone call over to Scott, see how mm-hmm. Scott's doing. Which I think without the training, I think that's what we used. What we we not we used to do. We still do. Um, you know, the officers all. Uh, who was on my truck? Oh, I got these four guys on my truck. Oh, I'll call them or I'll message them. I'm uh, messaging a little harder because you don't really get them. You don't really get their tone. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Good. Oh, was that good or is that uh, yeah, thumbs up? Yeah, I just got thumbs up. <laughs> um, or we're actually calling them or, or meeting them face to face. Yeah. Because then you can kind of see yeah. actually their reaction to what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the tactics, like you said, you don't want to get bogged down in the tactics, but, may- but maybe the tactics is what was bugging them. Like, oh man, like I feel bad because. It went, went south because I did this and I should have done that. So, and then that's kind of what we talked about. The tactical side of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and there's there's two ways to get away from that too. Like, if we if we have a larger scale event, um, you know, like we can, I think it's important we can sit down and do an operational debrief yeah. and say, hey, this is strictly operations, right? Mm-hmm. Here comes Scott's two star and a wish, right? Um, you know, like talk about that, and then. You can kind of pick out, say, okay, well, who do we want to talk to as well, um, and just get this. It helps get everybody talking and communicating, and then that might make me feel like, hey, you know what, that call is a little fucked up in my head, so I'm going to go talk to one of the officers or one of the, the peer team members or whoever, right? right. Um, or if you don't have that in your department, hey, who do I talk to for contact information yeah. to get a trained counselor, trauma informed counselor, to get that going? Uh, because as we know, you know, like just that. That stress leading up to post traumatic events, to post traumatic incidents, to post traumatic stress. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we can be doing to build that resilience in ourselves just to um, 
or kind of process everything. It takes a while. Yeah. Process of that. So. Uh, do you guys have anybody specifically in your department um, that you guys kind of lean on, or do you have uh, services outside? Like we we've had services that we always say, you know, there's always someone there to talk to. There's always people. Um, but now, like like Todd was saying, like he's part of a team for uh, his other job, and then like you guys are starting to build one mm -hmm. within your hall, uh, and I, I can see that coming here. Uh, do you guys have a team or a person, uh, you know, within your actual department uh, that you know, kind of looks after that? Um, I don't think there's anybody, probably nobody specific, um, but we do. I mean, we all look out for each other. With us being a smaller department, it would be hard to have a team, I think. Um, with we 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 all talk i mean it's uh it's better than it used to be for sure um but we do have a service outside of the fire hall that we can contact and if we need to talk to somebody then then we do it definitely every time we have new guys I always tell them that's that's one of the most important things that that uh that you can do is just get out and get out and talk to somebody and take care of your take care of yourself for sure so having smaller, like a smaller membership, like, like you guys have, what's kind of the age gap? Like, um, you know, we always talk about getting that, that newer blood in and, um, like people are, are, uh, products of their environment. Do you have a, like quite a large age gap from, you know, rookie member to seasoned firefighter or, um, you know, like, what does that look like for you guys? Um, I think our oldest active member is 60 or 61. Um, and our youngest is, he just graduated high school. So we do have a pretty good range and it seems to be like a pretty, um, like a pretty good stepping stone between, between the gaps. Um, when I joined, I was 18 or 19 and I mean, I'm, I'm 30 now. So, um, you know, I kind of, I kind of clung on to the the younger members at the time, but uh, um, we, I don't know, we we have a pretty good gap, and it, it's it's good because you get that new blood with the newer tactics, but you get that experience from the older guys. Do the older guys uh, embrace the uh, kind of the uh, PTSD system stuff, or do they no kind of put some dirt on it? <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Um you guys have you said those one just graduated high school. Do you guys have like a little high school like recruiting program at all? Or do you pull anybody in from school? Um, we have a junior program. You can start at the age of sixteen. You have to live in our area. Um but we we do want to get into the high schools and try to start recruiting people. I think that's kind of our, um, like we have to do something. I mean, you got to get, you got to get the young guys in when they can, when they have the time to get the schooling in. Right. Especially, I don't know. Do you guys have a minimum, um, like a minimum amount of hours you got to take for training? Uh, with our, uh, provincial standard, it's, I don't think it's a minimum amount of hours. It's just we you have to complete um, there's certain aspects of what's called it used to be called the playbook, not minimum standards. Um, yeah, you just have to complete the uh, JPRs, so the job performance uh, requirements here, um, for the uh, for each stage. So like ladders, not so sometimes if the class is really switched on, we can go through a little faster, and if they're you know, slower, it's like oh, yeah, well, we have to revisit this about five more times. Um, so, and then, yeah, it's just kind of ongoing. Um, so there's not really a, uh, I don't think there's really an hour standard for us anyways, probably for you guys, because you're probably, you're more the, the yeah, we're, we're the thing. same. So we do, we do the pro ward, the 1001 part of our program and whatnot. Um, but I think like more so even just like to showing up for practices and tracking hours of practice yeah. and training yeah. events and things like that. Like we still keep stats on your percentages over through the year. Yeah. yeah. And we try to have a, a minimum standard of, I think, I can't remember what it is, 70% or something like that. Yeah. But 
Uh, how are you guys doing? Yeah, we kind of have a, a point system now, actually, that, you know, the guys, if they're missing too many practices and, and their, their points don't um, stay up to snuff and then get talked to. Um, but for the most part, I think practices are, and, I, that, and the chief always reiterates that, and as a training officer, I always reiterate that. I think practices are uh, more important than even going to calls. Um, you know, obviously, we want them on those big calls and we need everybody, but uh, the practices is where, like, we, we need to know they know what they're doing. So if you come to if you come to every call but you you never come to practice, well that's gonna be bad. Um so Right, right, right. Yeah, for the most part I think uh most of you guys um come to more practices than they would calls obviously, um and train train regularly. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it's kinda of different than back when I started, when Todd and I started in this department, it was I think more guys would come to calls and less guys would come to practices, just because I think practices were less um were less exciting. Yeah, because it was well, always kind of short the same thing. too, right? Yeah, they're super short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now, like, we're we're running three hour practices uh, once a week. Um, and I mean, Christ, back back the day, there thirty like, minutes. <laughs> I was gonna say like an hour and a half. <laughs> hour, you know, after you sit around and talk about things and yeah, then get things started and because there'd be no real like pre set up for stuff and you set it up in the in that moment, so you're losing even more time. Uh, yeah, I think in today's like day and age, um, everybody's time is so so uh, valuable mm -hmm. that you can't really afford to show up with a half-assed plan for practice. You know, it's something that you have to plan ahead of time. You have to make sure it's it's good. It, you're you know putting the value of time and skill set you know forward because if, if you tried to run it like you know we used to in years gone by. Um, that's where you would get back to. You have more members coming to calls than you would to practice. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have you have to value guys, guys and gals' times. Um, make it good. Make it challenging. Uh, most people are pretty switched on if they want to be in the fire service. And if you come to a pretty boring or a lame lame practice, like we we try to avoid uh, classroom at all costs. <laughs> There's maybe a handful a year that you you know you have to get get through. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, we we definitely dive into the hands-on practice as often as possible, um, and that keeps people engaged. You know, like like Scott was saying, like when you don't know what they don't know, it can be a challenge on the fire ground. Um, like we have a complement right now of about thirty-seven in our hall. I know you guys are creeping up around the same number there now. Yeah, we're um, you know, like it's not a huge number, but it's still like you know, in the heat of the moment, you're looking over at you know him or her and you're like ah, do they know what they're doing here like have have we trained this and not so much for the seasoned firefighters but for more of the rookies right like yeah. you know like like we're all hands-on with the rookies scott basically as our uh, to he sees them through the entire way and as another officer that does a lot of our training you know you try to be with that group as much as possible but we still have a group of 30 other ones that we have to go out and make a good you know training night for as well so yeah so it's <clears throat> it's tough to follow along and make make sure that that you are aware of what step they're on and what step you know like like okay they're you know good for uh, water supply which might be you know they might have to run a tender um they're good with uh hose movement and water management so mm -hmm. okay now they could use some exterior water application but at, at what point you know when you have such a large group um if, if you're not doing, you know, good, solid, you know, like, uh, like we, I say weekly practices with them, uh, it's really easy to start to lose, to lose grasp of where, where everybody lands, mm -hmm. which then can be kind of dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it's always a, it's always a fine line of juggling mm -hmm. the practices to, uh, the time commitments to everybody. We, like, we do our best to try and organize things for everyone's, especially summertime. Sometimes it gets busy. Yep. We want to be out and about. Um, but you, you know, there there is a certain level of dedication. You you, you have to have you have to keep coming in for certain things. Um, some people complain about it in our apartment. Um, there's some nights I'm complaining about like, oh man, I don't want to go in tonight, <laughs> right? Yeah. But like you, you have to. Like right? this is this is serious stuff. Like this isn't. Uh, a uh, little old boys club like it used to be back in the day. Sure. Um, this is this is some serious shit that we're doing, um, and we're doing it on the side for fun. Yeah, right. Especially you, 
So you guys are strictly volunteer. No, we're paid on call. We have a small amount of you know, stipend with it, but for the most part, I don't even look at the paycheck. I could care less about the paycheck. I started. I'm not getting rich. You know? <laughs> I started in the fire service, following my dad's footsteps, and then it was a blast doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a certain level of commitment you need to make that big time for. Us. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Yeah, you definitely have to be committed with uh, training. I, I tell my wife all the time, uh, there's no level of training that's enough for what we do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of the some of the older members, too, you have to tell them, um, you know, it, I, I know we're not paid. I know we're not career, but we still have to be professional, have to remain professional. And yeah. it, you're essentially you're still doing the same job. So show up and act like it is, is is one of my biggest things. Yeah, I think that's huge, right? Like when somebody phones 911 and they ask for the fire fire department to show up, when we pull up, they're not like, oh, it's okay. They're just volunteers and expect less. No, when the fire department shows up, they expect perfection and nothing less. So it doesn't right. matter how big the check is or if it's nothing when we show up they're expecting perfection so i mean that's such a high standard <laughs> it's an impossible standard so the least that we can do is show up and train to try to get as damn close to that as possible mm-hmm. yeah. fire doesn't care no fire doesn't care <laughs> doesn't care <laughs> fire doesn't care if you're paid or not yeah. that's right um uh, all right um we're going to start wrapping it up here. Anything, Kyle, that uh, you want to bring up before we come to a close? Um, I kind of touched on it earlier, but the mental health. Um, if, if you're thinking about getting into this, if you're already into it, take care of your mental health. I distance myself enough. Um, now my wife knows what to look for, but it took me – Probably six years from the call that was really bugging me to finally go and 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 uh, and talk to someone, and I actually took a line of duty death in our neighboring EMS department to actually get me there. So, um, just definitely take care of yourself. There's always going to be that one call, but don't let that one call determine the the end of your life or, or, or drinking too much or getting into drug use or any of that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, uh, looking out for each other is, is key, right? Um, more training and awareness within our departments and include, include your spouses or significant others, right? Um, because they're the first ones that will start to see some of the change in us. Um, when somebody goes to a tough event, uh, you know, they're really good at hiding, symptoms right and yeah your spouses usually see that first mm-hmm. so anytime you have a training or awareness course on these things include your spouses um so like i said they, they know what to look for and uh the more and more you talk about it within your departments the more and more normalized normal it feels it's normalizing mm-hmm. the situation right um because these are these are normal um normal feelings to have for abnormal events essentially right yeah. Um, like we're not wired to be going into horrific traumatic scenes day in and day out. Uh, you know, we're, we're human. We have, we break, um, yeah. Finding, finding time for yourselves, uh, getting out, doing some physical activity, whatever that may be for people. Just it's proven, you know, 10 minutes of physical activity after an event, uh, it starts making some chemical changes in your body and brain and, and starts, um, helping you process the event. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't let it define yourself, right? Yeah, don't <laughs> don't take the route that I started to take. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I definitely appreciate you sharing that with us and all of our listeners. Um, it takes people, you know, with some courage to speak up. Um, people that have been been through it, you know, themselves, or you know, maybe they they maybe helped a fellow firefighter through something. Um, just you know, getting that knowledge out there, getting you know, just kind of normalizing it, right? Like, um, there's a, a stat, something like every human is kind of wired to deal with like five traumatic events in their lifetime. And on average, we're going to wipe that out in the case, in like the course of a year, right? So yeah. we're burning up annually our 
our lifespan of traumatic events to try to process. And like for most people, that's going to be like that or a death of a parent or two or, or, or like a pet even, right? Like something is like, as I don't want to say simple, because though they're like a pet is very, very important, but that might be one of their top five events, right? Mm -hmm. Like then all of these things that like we in the service go and deal with is amplified over and over and over again. And it takes one. Um, and it doesn't matter how, like what it is, how big, how small, it doesn't matter because one event might trigger something from the past. Um, you know, just getting that normal see you. Um, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to reach out for help. Um, and it's normal. And the more that we can normalize that through newer members coming on and just changing that culture um, from the old days when you would just rub some dirt on it, you know, have a bottle, um, where now, hey, like, let's not, you know, sewer my marriage and sewer my Monday to Friday job. Like, let's actually get some help here and get myself through it so I can continue doing that thing that I love. And because there's not a lot of people wired to do the thing that we love. So to remove somebody that's super good at something because they didn't have available or even that they, they just maybe weren't mentally ready to seek that help. Um, yeah, I just think it's super, super good to continue to spread that awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, Kyle, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and talking with us and thanks for sharing that, um, with us as well. Mm -hmm. Um, any more guys to group? Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, bud. All right. All right. I appreciate you. appreciate you guys having me. It was it was a good talk. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you once again. So, Kyle uh, Tomine, first lieutenant from uh, Rona Park. From Rona. Rona. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Kyle once again for uh, coming on tonight and mm -hmm. taking the time. It was very late. His uh, in his neck of the world there. Oh, he's yes. neck of the world. <laughs> what? The fucking east. John's tired. John's tired. It's not late here, but John got it. It was late there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Kyle. Much appreciated. Yeah, so uh, coming on. Um, let's jump into some shout outs. Sure. Right? Uh, what are we at? Modus. Modus. Um, yeah, so it's been awesome. Uh, Paul's been texting me throughout the week. Sending texting me. you too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he's blowing all of our phones. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Give a few little things and I love pictures it. and yeah, some future product changes. So, yeah, yeah we're, we're we, we kind of helping them with their. I think maybe, maybe we're not helping them. <laughs> we're making it worse uh, with yeah. their product line a little bit. Um, with some uh, some new stuff for auto education. Next line. The X line. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that are we about to talk about? Yeah, the Auto X line. I think we talked about it. The Motor X. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on that. Uh, working on some uh, medical bag stuff, mm -hmm. and then uh, some ideas on some wildland deer, sprinklers, yeah. and things like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, but what their big claim to fame is is a sniper tool. We actually have one right here. Okay. <laughs> oh, nice. Question. I don't. Did they make this color? I, I haven't seen this color in a while, but anyways, same. <laughs> they do, because we had some wedges that were that color. The wedges, wedges. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, Snagger, uh, big claim to fame. It's multi-use, hundred and two uses now. I can only get through about twenty, I think. Yeah. Before my brain goes, what else is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, the big one is getting that two and a half uh, controlled while you're trying to run it. Uh, you can run it it's kind of solo. Um, obviously, that also has the H and a half on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, glass breaker. Uh, drywall cutter, gas shut, gas shut off. off. Okay. It's actually a great tool. I take when I do my 360 as an officer. Yeah, just like it does a lot. Stay there, this you know, fighting off dogs. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like 100 trees. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that's the thing. <laughs> Modus. <laughs> and there's a discount code for Modus. Yeah, the TFF five. Awesome. Uh, then the other one is uh, stop and leave. Actually, that's you, right? <laughs> yep, uh, you got your three methods of uh, bleed control. Uh, you got direct pressure, uh, wood packing, and tourniquet applications. Um, if you're going to use tourniquet, make sure you use a good one. If you're going to have a tourniquet, get it out of the wrapper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Or was it stop the bleed dot? Uh, dot .org or, or dot, dot .ca, CA. Or we'll take to, yeah, yep. exactly. Uh, depending on where you're listening. Yep. Yeah, uh, Wolf Tree Coffee. Yeah, uh, got a little bit of trouble today as we're in a, <laughs> we're in a, <laughs> Another type of uh, coffee company is just that funny today. <laughs> and uh, the, the owners of Wolf saw me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, it's the only one I had. Clean. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, they, they, but at the same time, in my coffee cup, well, it's not, I have Wolf Tree coffee. <laughs> mm, perfect. Yeah. yeah. The initial attack blend, which is our blend. Um, Lovely medium dark roast. And, yeah. Yeah. Been crushing their uh, uh, cold brew mm-hmm. lately. That's, that is phenomenal. Unofficially called the cold start. Unofficially the cold start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and where can we find Wolf Tree at online? Yeah, they're on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, they've got their uh, uh, their Facebook page, which just got updated, which is really cool. Uh, WolfTreeCoffee.com, I believe. Um, hop on there. You can see all of their product offerings. Um, if you look at our, uh, the initial attack blend, which we partnered with them, uh, it'll give you all the information about the coffee and about uh, the $2 of each sale. Uh, the proceeds will do the Honor Society mm-hmm. uh, and the Honor Ranch. Uh, so yeah, uh, support an awesome company, drink some awesome coffee, and on the back side of that, you are making a $2 donation. So awesome all around. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that just that donation on top of it, it's... Can't go wrong. Come on. Yeah. Or from Wolf Street. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Tanner. Tanner Olson Country Music out of the West Coast of Canada. They are on tour all over right now and doing a bunch of things. Uh, lots of new music coming out. Mm-hmm. Check them out on Spotify or wherever you find music. Mm-hmm. And Scott, can you grab a shirt there? Oh, yeah. So, again, as a reminder, we have our shirts uh, that we are selling. So, currently, uh, so the GCF app for who's the fire picture. We're just shipping through Canada, however, probably next week we're going to be uh, international, just waiting to hear back. Uh, so send us a message uh, via email on that. Um, and I think, let's check if it's going to be actually, I think it's going to be DTFF shop uh, very shortly here. But in, nice. the, in the meantime, um, or is it just DTFF.com? Mm-hmm. I can't remember. <laughs> we are the worst. Yeah. Check us on Facebook, I think. Is yeah, the, best. the link is on Facebook. <laughs> the link's right on Facebook. Um, yeah, so pretty shortly, so I was talking to my wife. We're going to be yeah, changing it to the echo DTF of shop at gmail.com. That's right. going to be one coming up. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, yeah, find it on Facebook and we'll send you all that stuff. Yeah. So I currently got a couple more shirts to be going out here. So, nice. Uh, so $35, uh, we'll get that shipped uh, uh, anywhere in uh, Canada. And it's important to remember that second F, or you might find something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the beans. Now to fight fire. See, watch that. Go right back to the beans. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other channels? No, that's it. Uh, and then, of course, you have us. So, Facebook, YouTube, um, Instagram, those are kind of our biggest platforms, TikTok. Um, yeah, give us a like, give us a follow. Um, Send some messages, emails uh, through uh, Messenger as well, Facebook Messenger, Instagram Messenger. You can get a hold of us. Uh, we actually have people paying attention to that now, which is yeah. fantastic. It's amazing. Show it to our exposes for that. Um, and yeah, uh, new is that is our other Facebook shut down yet? Our old one. It is still live. Uh, we're still hopeful to get a few more pe- people over, but it will be getting shut down yeah. quite quickly. So. so look for our Facebook page. It's the one currently with the Moose logo on it. That's the one yeah. you're watching yeah. on it. The other yeah. one will be shut down. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for listening, everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, any more, more? Any more? There's Scott. Nope. Good night. Ash. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good night.